welcome everybody to today's guest lecture. And I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Martin Mandelberg with us, who has been busy assembling many, many impressive assets and really interesting information items in support of a Hamming biography. And today, Dr. Mandelberg is going to give us an update on his work. And you've probably seen a bunch of it already. We have two lectures in Calhoun that are linked on the site. We have a third session that he gave to the Atomic Heritage Foundation. And he even unlocked for us a handful of Hamming videos called Computers in the Mind of Man. They're, they're black and white. They're legacy. They're from back in the day, before, days before he came to NPS even. So pretty interesting stuff. So Dr. Mandelberg, the uh, Marty, the virtual podium is all yours. Thank you. Don, thank you. Can people hear me? Yes, sir. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. I'd like to bring up, Don, is it, could we share the uh, PowerPoint presentation for today? Okay, thank you. I have 14 PowerPoints just to use as a walkthrough. And thank you all. Threw up a couple of pictures of Richard Wesley Hamming that you may not have uh, seen. And they're all out of the biography, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, Don, let's no, see. No, we can. We... Okay. Thank you. Well, there's a ghost here somewhere. Okay, so going on to page two, let's see if it works. Agenda, hopefully. Six items I'd like to do in the allocated time. I'm going to start with a little bit of reflections on Richard Wesley Hamming, talk about the biography that I completed, although it's copyrighted 2018, I've been receiving some good feedback from reviews and I pulled the print version off, did a short version as marketing and we're editing the final version. I expect it to be out within the month. And number three, what, what, Oh boy, why you should want to understand what he was trying to do. What am I trying to say that? I'll find out when I get to number three. And want to see if you have any questions about Hamming and his work. And what would Hamming say if he was here today? And then I'd like to end with something that Hamming chose to do. It's called Great Thoughts Time. And see if we can do a little exercise at the end of the meeting. At the footnote, you'll see the basis for my understanding of Hamming. I knew of Hamming in the early 70s from some publications. In fact, I referenced er error correcting codes in a non-technical reason when I was at the Naval War College in 75. But when I arrived at Monterey, I wasn't envisioning working with Hamming, but he came to my rescue. And when you read my book, you'll see how and why. And he was my advisor from October of 78 through June of 82. And I decided in 2017 to create this legacy project of Richard Wesley Hamming, started researching the way he taught me to research, and with my own twist, had a lot of good fortune to meet people like Eleanor Ulanger, the previous librarian at NPS, Tom Roscoe, the new one, of course, Professor Brutzman, was very helpful. Dr. Loomis and others were able to point me into some directions and I just charged ahead. And I think I have a good story to tell. I've completed the book and it's just being edited. Okay, let's see if I can page down here. Okay, some thoughts about Hamming. He was born in 1915. As he was graduating, while he was in high school, there were two important things in his life. One was the Depression, <laughs> stock market crash, which 
wiped out both his parents' families' fortunes, the stock market class of 27. So he had to struggle to get into college. The 1932 uh, Centennial World's Fair was in Chicago, and Hamming and his older brother, James, went there, and everyone at that time wanted to be an engineer. Edison, Tesla, you know, Carnegie, the world was becoming technology, and the way for a immigrant family, you know, he was first generation American, his father was born in Holland, uh, to get ahead in his mind was to be an electrical engineer. He, applied, he was good at mathematics, applied for electrical engineering fellowships because the family did not have much money and none were forthcoming. But because of his math skills, University of Chicago said, wow, you've completed your associate's degree, three different colleges, two of which folded during the depression. And he graduated Crane College and with his associates, University of Chicago says, we don't have an electrical engineering department, but we have a very good mathematics department. We'll give you a scholarship to come here. That change in Hamming's life from wanting to be an electrical engineer to a mathematician was crucial. Some of you will find comments in some of his papers or writings. He considers that very fortunate because math is really where he belonged. He completed his uh, bachelor's at Chicago, master's at Nebraska, and his doctorate at University of Illinois. Along the way, he had some driving factors. He's quoted to say, I did not want to be rich, but I did not want to be as poor as my parents were. Uh, sidebar, they lived in the same apartment for 30 years until Hamming got married or was off at college. He lived in the same apartment uh, building that he was born in. He wanted choices. He didn't want monies for money's sake, but he wanted to do what he wanted to do. So there's a good quote. He wanted to understand things. He wanted to succeed, and he wanted to help others. During his life, he also found ways of turning information to knowledge, getting some wisdom, both his master's and doctoral dissertations were on partial differential equations, which happened to be uh, crucial if you want to do physics and many other sciences. Um, he uh, worked with some excellent uh, professors, uh, both in mathematics, Truszynski was his uh, doctoral advisor at University of Illinois, and he also was a mentor. He had an impressive 52 doctoral students, and in many cases, he reached into his own pocket and helped his students financially. Because again, this is right after the Depression, times were hard. Uh, Hamming became, he had, that as a good role model, a couple of other role models, you'll see when you later read the book. He wanted to focus on important problems, but when he graduated, the proper thing for him to do was teach mathematics. And he taught at a number of colleges until the call came from a good friend that he was needed in the Southwest. Some, as some of you know, that was the Manhattan Project. Hamming could not know that until he arrived. Those of you who have security clearances at a high level, you'll know what I mean. You don't really know what the problem is until they brief you in to that compartment. Anyhow, Hamming asked his good friend, Nick Metropolis, who was trying for six months to recruit him. And he says, okay, Nick, is it really important? And Nick Metropolis is quoted by Wanda Hamming, Richard's wife, I have it in writing, it will help end the war. Hamming and his wife had followed the international news. They knew of research on atomic energy and um, 
they guessed what it was. So Hamming left his teaching job, went to Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, interestingly, when Wanda arrived a number of weeks later, uh, Hamming met her, and of course there was a military car to take them through the security thing. According to uh, other sources, I think it was Hirsch Loomis, uh, Dick Hamming reached over and said one phrase to his wife, U-238, and now she knew what they were working on. She, in fact, also worked at Los Alamos operating some of the mechanical calculators. So this was Hamming's first big problem. He changed from a math teacher to a mathematician. And that's what I talk about in the book. So the biography talks about chapter one as an overview. I just want to give you a feeling of the biography. I'm not putting it out here, but at some point it will be available for you. Um, man is his upbringing, uh, his role models, a couple of significant ones in his life. His mathematician, uh, when he worked at Los Alamos and he stayed on, and then a wonderful 30-year career at Bell Labs, which is where most of the work that you're all familiar with Herring, having the error correcting code, the Hamming window, the Hamming distances, the Hamming weights, and many, many other things that the literature doesn't cover. I've found a number of them from working with Bell Labs and they'll be in the books, or I'll respond to questions as you wish. Suffice it to say, at the end of 30 years at Bell Labs, Richard Hamming was the vice president of research. He reported to the president of Bell Labs. He was that, uh, uh, powerful. Along the way, he got the 1968 uh, Turing Award after Alan Turing um, that was issued by the Association for Computing Machinery. I have the story. He was the third awardee. That's called equivalent to me the Nobel Prize in Mathematics. There is not a Nobel in Math. The Turing is one of the highest awards. The Abel, the Fields, and the Reams Award are the three others having won the rings. Chapter four talks about Hamming as a mentor. He had been teaching as an adjunct faculty at a number of colleges, and he took two sabbaticals and taught at um, Stanford and I believe UC Davis. And he continued to write, and when he retired Bell Labs, he chose to come to the Naval Postgraduate School, which was fortunate for all of us, myself specifically. I, chapter four, I go through uh, people who knew Hamming, including Professor Brutzman, and uh, a number of other distinguished professors uh, gave me information all the way back to Hamming in 1958 uh, at Bell Labs. So two people from Bell Labs, someone who's currently a professor at University of Maryland, another one at Dartmouth, another one at Princeton, and everyone else is from NPS. At the end, I propose a legacy to Hamming, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, my findings on Hamming. He grew up in interesting times. I already alluded to the fact that with the Depression and with the World's Fair and the coming out of the Depression, a young teenager with math, knowledge, and interest would naturally gravitate towards technology and innovation. A lot of role models. Hamming also read science fiction, as many of us did at a younger age. It gives you ideas. I've heard the phrase science fiction should really be renamed science future, because a lot was what was written in science fiction has come uh, to play. Um, his parents, were immigrant, well, his father was an immigrant from Holland, his mother from a, a longtime family all the way back to the American Revolution. Her mother's maiden name was Redfield, but they were all working hard to make it better for the next generation. Richard Hemming's brother um, uh, went to bachelor's and master's in uh, the West Coast. He was an officer in Second World War. Hamming wanted to be successful. He wanted to have choices. Money was not the driver, and throughout his life, it never was. 
Um, it turns out his maternal grandfather, Casper Lavater Redfield, was um, a driving issue for him. He wrote books, a significant number of books, about um, uh, the great man theory, which says that uh, greatness is not born, but you can develop it. Um, his good friend, Nick Metropolis, who would be uh, his friend throughout his life, was the individual who helped him get to Los Alamos. His future wife, Wanda Little, humanized uh, Dick Hamming. They were life partners for almost 60 years. Uh, and his doctoral advisor, I believe, financially helped him. Uh, when Hamming was um, arrived at Los Alamos, he's working with people like Oppenheimer, Teller, Fermi, Feynman, Hans Bethe, Stanislav Ulam. Almost every one of those people won a Nobel Prize, either before or after the Manhattan Project. Um, some, uh, uh, John von Neumann, a brilliant mathematician, a polymath. Um, Albert Einstein uh, and Hamming met once. Uh, Einstein was never out at uh, Los Alamos because of his foreign born. He was not allowed a security clearance. Well, that many of these were immigrants. Um, uh, Einstein uh, stayed at Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. Hamming would see him when he was at Bell Labs. Hamming taught at Princeton when he was at Bell Labs. These world-class scientists um, amazed Hamming. He said, how can they be so smart? Well, they worked hard and they were smart. Hamming spent a lot of time studying people who he could observe and he read everything um, and therefore built up his mastery of mathematics, applied mathematics. The field of computer simulation was an outgrowth of some of his work at Los Alamos. Sidebar, um, even though Hamming left uh, the Manhattan Project six months after the Trinity explosion, he continued almost every summer to return to Los Alamos, work with Nick Metropolis and others on fields that are primarily classified, but from people who know, I've come to the, my opinion, conclusion, he was helping them with computer simulation for 50 years. Uh, very little of that is written in the unclassified manner. Professor Brussman and I are going to look into following up on the Los Alamos and what we can say on a follow-on paper. Um, he believed in being prepared. He uh, used the phrase, luck prepares the prepared mind from Pasteur and about being prepared for opportunities. Okay, we're almost halfway through. Just throwing up a couple of pictures, odd moments, baby picture, high school yearbook, his good friend, Nick Metropolis. Uh, Hamming met his wife, a mutual friend said, you guys both like to dance. Hamming was 21, Wanda was 16. They dated all the time while he was in college, she was also in college. Um, when he got his PhD, that same month or two apart, she got her master's and Phi Beta Kappa in English with a minor in math. They were a good team, they worked together. So University of, Illinois, of Chicago, University of Nebraska, University of Illinois. Okay, a little bit of findings. What I was able to find and will be available was Hemming had a reputation for excellence. When he attacked a problem at uh, his three colleges, undergraduate and two graduate, he did it thoroughly. So his faculty members uh, would probably have given him a recommendation to move ahead. By the way, for his graduate work, as those of you who went through NPS and myself, he received a fellowship. The family did not have the money. But because of his excellence, he leveraged his work. Having examined the world-class people, as I mentioned before, 
and created his own insight and started developing his own thoughts for the future. He had not published much that I can find during graduate school. It was, he started writing when at Los Alamos and his error correcting code work happened only two and a half, three years after the work at Los Alamos, at which point he became very prolific. Over a hundred journal and technical articles, uh, 10 books, three patents, many students at a variety of colleges during his 30 years. Because of his excellence at Los Alamos, he got invited to go to Bell Labs. Those of you who are interested would, would uh, to read some of the books on Bell Labs. It must have been a magnificent place to work. The AT&T phone system was a monopoly. They took a small percentage of their profits and hired thousands of masters and PhD graduates, showed them the telephone system and said, do what you want to do at the, the end of the year. Tell us how it came out. They didn't have to put a proposal in what they were going to do. They were given a free wheel, and AT&T had some very smart managers who knew how to manage researchers since they'd been around for a while. And it was an amazing time from 1946 for a 15, 20 year period. Some of the inventions that came out of Bell Labs, obviously the transistor, you may not know, the solar cell, error correcting codes, communication satellites, video and audio recording synced up, there's quite a few developments and patents that came out of that Bell Labs. I would have loved to have worked there, but I didn't have the grades at that time to get uh, brought in. Hamming was also successful in working with others. He helped form the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM. He was a member of a number of organizations, which you see at the bottom. Many of them gave him awards, both before and after the Turing Award. Okay, moving ahead. Okay, uh, at just a couple pictures of Los Alamos for those who don't know. In the middle, the photo of Enrique Fermi and Robert Oppenheimer, that's an analog computer. That's what they had to do integration and differential equations on. There was a Marchant mechanical calculator you can find in the Smithsonian Museum or out at Los Alamos. To the right, a hand-operated calculator. And then IBM came out with a model 601 multiplier in the lower left in 1944. They were shipped to Los Alamos, and it was a digital relay computer that would multiply a 10-digit number by a 10-digit number at the speed of four seconds which sounds slow, but the alternative was 100 people with hand calculators who would get dyslexic sometime. The computers didn't tire, they occasionally broke down, but they were accurate. Hamming's job was to use them, how to figure out how to use them to help Feynman, Teller, Fermi, Ulam, Oppenheimer, and others do the math to do the physics to design the bomb. 16 July 1945, the test at Alamogordo, codenamed Trinity, was the first weapon. And the silver lapel pin in the lower corner was given to Hamming. That is in the special collection at NPS. Okay, when Hamming went to Bell Labs, top left corner, someone already there was Claude Elwood Shannon. When Professor Brussman talks about information theory, much of that credit for that, but not all of it, goes to Claude Shannon. In the middle, you'll see a circle, alternately called the Young Turks or the Younger Turks, were a group of five people. From the top, Shannon, the middle, Hamming, the bottom, Macmillan, to the right, John Tukey, to the left, Ling. These five people worked 
in a collaborative environment at times and then by themselves at times. But that was the kitchen core cabinet of mathematicians who worked on some of the problems. I see a number of documents in my research where they would jointly work. Shannon and Hamming didn't jointly publish, but they shared an office for a period of time and bounced ideas off of each other. John Tukey to the right with his hand on his chin, little things like the fast Fourier transform. All of these people won major awards and they, some of them credit each other for help. You can see Hamming and the top corner to, with Bernard Holbrook, a piece of machinery to develop error correcting, to sh demonstrate error correcting codes. Sidebar, Hamming had the idea of error correcting codes in his head because he published in 1947, 48, an internal tech memo. Bell Labs loved it so much. They said, we're gonna get a patent. It's gonna take a year and a half, polish up your words, and then it'll go in the Bell Systems Technical Journal. Meanwhile, Claude Shannon developed information theory and the two of them published within a month of each other in 1950. But Hamming's error correcting work and Shannon's information theory work were right on top of each other time phrase. The Turing Award that Hamming has, there's the picture. And again, that award is gold and it sits in uh, the Dudley Knox Library. It was donated by the family. Hamming spent 30 years there and you see a picture at the computer center in 1975. Hammond retired after 30 years because he felt it's time to leave the money for the younger people. He was already 62 years old, he had a 30 year nice retirement. He had enjoyed teaching and he decided that's what he wanted to do. And if you read in the book, you'll find out he chose the postgraduate school of Monterey by choice. Okay, here's a picture of Richard and Wanda Hamming coming to Monterey. He arrived in September of 1976. I arrived a year later, and a year after that, I started to work with him. Picture of him in his office. Yes, you notice in the upper corner, I've put Hamming looking over all the slides at us. I think he's out there looking at us right now. I believe that He's at a different level. Okay, moving on to slide 12. My research was trying to focus on why did he want to mentor people? Why didn't he just retire to a big job at Stanford and give talks and write papers? He wanted to come to NPS because he saw motivated students, future admirals, he would call them, future professors like Don Brutzman, who was a student in his class. And Hamming liked the energy and the focus. So he chose NPS at a much lower salary than he could have gotten at Stanford, but he wanted the freedom to do what he was doing. I was able to interview 15 separate people. Eight of them gave me enough information to include them in the book in addition to my story and his impact on helping people. Hamming became a mentor and once he chose to do that, it was all in or nothing. If you had an issue and you sat down with Hamming, either he would help you come to a way of solving it in that first meeting or he'd get back to you. It was all or nothing. He didn't go off and decide issues once he came to NPS. Okay, if Hamming was here today, he'd be 105 years old. He'd be amazed by the technology of your smartphone, but not really. He saw the powers of 10 that have happened on a regular basis. So I'm now gonna open up to this next phase what would Hamming say if he was here today in this class? Would he say the 
subtitle of his most popular book, Numerical Methods for Scientists and Engineers, which has had like eight printings, including like seven languages, including Russian. I've met two members of the Russian Academy of Science, and they said, so you were Hamming students. We, we used his book. Would he say the purpose of computing is insight? Would he say it's better to do the right problem the wrong way than the wrong problem the right way? I think he would do number three. And he used this at Bell Labs. He would sit down with people, listen to them for a while, and then he would say, what are the most important problems in your field? Then he'd pause. And then he'd say, what are you working on? And he'd hear the answers. And he'd say, why aren't they the same? That's a very telling challenge. And it got under some people's skin at Bell Labs, but it came back to add to his credit. The current president of Bell Labs, Bell Labs was originally American Telephone and Telegraph sometime in the mid 80s, I believe. I could be off a few years. The Bell monopoly was broken up into the regional Bell operating companies and Bell Labs was split into a couple of parts and the part that Hamming had worked for was sold to Alcatel Lucent. That worked for a while. About five years ago, four or five years ago, it was bought by Nokia, the Finnish company. The president of Nokia, Bell Labs, Marcus Weldon, and his people were so enamored with Hamming's work, they renamed the main auditorium at Bell Labs, which for 70 years had been McNulty Hall, and I don't know if anyone knows who McNulty is. They renamed the auditorium Hamming Innovation Hall. That's pretty powerful. But what do you think Hamming would say to us today? You've all seen a number of his videos. You've been in this course. Uh, we got I get four or five more weeks. I'd like to open it for discussion. What do you think Hamming might talk to us about? I'm going to go on. Who would like to talk? A thought. It doesn't have to be right. It's just a discussion item. I think he would be very impressed on all the technique we utilize today. He uh, talked about 25 years ago, and maybe today he would talk about electricity, hydrogen, or something else, maybe something that will drive us in, uh, in 20 years or 20 years down the road. So he would adapt all the things we already have done and would come up with a new vision um, where we would see the world in 20 years. He might well do that. Somebody else? I call Hamming a polymath. He read physics. He read astronomy. I don't know if he spoke any foreign languages. I think he had a little German for some articles that he read. I never, never saw him write in any language other than English, but he corresponded with people around the world. He gave speeches in Europe, in Germany and England. He would look across many things. At Bell Labs, he was into crystal, a purity of crystals, into communications signaling. While he was a mathematician, he was an applied mathematician, a computer scientist. He was a research mathematician. He loved a new problem into many different domains. Okay, anybody else care to? Okay, I'll leave it for your thoughts. Hamming, I think, would challenge us. Are you working on important problems or are you just doing a job and going home with the carpool at 4.30? I believe Hamming would be challenging us to be working on the important problems. Because I've, I heard Hamming tell me the following, and I think he also wrote it. 
if you work on a insignificant or trivial problem and you solve it, that's nice, but so what? If you work on a really important problem and you make and publish progress towards the answer and then someone else picks it up and carries it another 30 yards down the field and then someone makes a touchdown, you all get credit. And that's the job of a scientist is to write, lecture, pass your ideas along, not keep them for profit. That's why he liked academia rather than industrial research. And he published a lot. The book that's the basis of the course you're in right now is the culmination of all of his other books and all of his work since he was a student at University of Illinois. I think he would pick a variation of number three. I'll leave that thought with you. I'm gonna go on to the last chart. If you haven't come across it in some of the things you've read on Hamming, you'll get it in the last lecture when Professor Brutzman talks about you and your research. You and your research is probably Hamming's most um, remembered speech, and he gave a number of it. 10 years after he left Bell Labs, he was invited back to then McNulty Hall, where a thousand people heard him give the speech, you and your research. He had written it and given it before. It wasn't written specifically for Bell Labs, but it was so powerfully received that he got a lot of accolades and four years ago, when Nokia president uh, Marcus Weldon, who is a chemist by training, took over Nokia Bell Labs, he got permission from the ACM and printed, I believe, 500 copies of that speech, gave it to all his managers, and with a simple one sense command, now read it and do it Hamming's way. And then he named the hall Hamming Innovation Hall. That's in Murray Hill. It's a very powerful end to the course, and I'm glad that you're going to be able to get to it. You have to read it a couple of times. But in it, he says, if you're going to work on important problems, you've got to devote and cut out the time. It's nice to say, oh, yeah, I'll get, at, I'll get to it after I solve everything else on my to-do list. Hamming knew that humans could be busy with other things. So Hamming consciously got all of his work, the work he was doing with others and for himself, done by lunchtime on Friday. And then starting with lunch and for the rest of the afternoon and evening, he would attempt to surround himself by smart people and say, what's going to be the future of the Bell system? What do we need to work on? He called it great thoughts time. It didn't matter if it was impractical, if it required something on the periodic chart that had not yet been developed. He wanted to discuss and capture. He was a futurist. And if you don't talk about it, and if you don't write it down, it's as if you never did it. Having made me promise to teach, and I became a, an adjunct faculty member at a number of colleges as I moved around the country. In 2005, I became a full professor at a small college for a while, and I've had two master's students and two doctoral students. Uh, professor Brutzman has had many more. And having says, you must teach because if you can't teach it, you don't understand it. You must write articles. And I encourage all of you, either writing about your thesis or another topic, get in the habit of writing. It could be a 500-word article or my book is 100,000 words. If you don't write, it's as if you didn't do it. And so he wanted me to write, teach, lecture, public speaking. If you can't communicate your ideas to your boss, 
or to somebody else, it's as if you didn't do it. That's a part of important efforts. So, again, I'm going to open up, and maybe we have some wall talkers right now. Within your service, Navy, Army, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marines, civilian side, what is, what are the important problems in the next 5, 10, or 20 years? Let's use this discussion among this cohort of people. Maybe a year from now, you'll get back together with some of these people and say, remember that crazy idea of what we were talking about on the, uh, in uh, the day in May? Maybe we have, I just read something, and maybe we can carry it a little farther down the field. So let me open up. Within your service or within your organization, if you're back, if you're out in industry now, what are problems that we don't have solutions for us today? Let's talk about the problem domain. Who would like to go first? John. I think within the Marine Corps, a lot of it's the age old problem that we've always had of how do we maintain relevance and not and separate ourselves from the army. So that way Congress doesn't get rid of us and then combating the emerging technologies and and that we have the emerging technologies over our adversaries. A lot of that comes with AI or hypersonic type stuff, which is the current issue. You know, I think the future issue is going to be more integration of space systems and possibly the militarization of space. Okay. If I could ask you to take your first issue about relevance relevance so that you're not just Army, you know, version one of the Army or, or the version end of the Army. Could you put it, could you think about 20 words? And if you can't do it now, I'd like you to think about doing it over the next week and write your problem statement in 20 or 30 words and choose every word succinctly and put it on a piece of a, a post-it and put it on the wall. And every week at a certain time, look at it. And you never know when you can start down the path to success. If you're comfortable with it, share it with your other cohorts. And that way you've got people focused on the specific words rather than the loose concept. Good job. Somebody else? This is freewheeling. You're not going to get the sentence right the first time. And Don doesn't give me the ability to grade. So <laughs> I'm doing this as your first open-ended great thoughts session. You can grade if you want, Marty. This is a discovery process here. Why not? Whatever you say, Don. I found it a useful exercise when I started this, and it helped my career. Mike, I can't see if you're raising your hands or Lauren or Bert because you don't have your screen on. Any thoughts? You're quiet. Hey, Marty. Mike here. It's an interesting question. So I'm in the Navy and I'm a SEAL. And as we look at this, artificial intelligence scares a lot of people in my community, I think, because the battlefield is uneven, if you will, from a SEAL perspective, because we're able to come on top with, you know, 3D picture with the air support and just the overwhelming power if we needed to. With artificial intelligence, you know, the, the, the battlefield is evened out. And I think going back to what John said about being relevant, it really is a question that, you know, it doesn't matter anymore if you can, you know, climb, a, you know, a, a 20 mile mountain and, you know, and, and carry so many pounds. We're looking at things differently now and, and almost in a cognitive aspect where one, as a SEAL, we need to be making sure that we get the right people in our community. And the other is, what is our mission going to be if the battlefield is evened out, if that makes sense? Okay, so let me see if I can play back a 20-word version of what you said. If an adversary uses advanced technologies 
and neutralizes some of our superiority, what do we do about it? Is that close? Yeah, that, that's on point. And then how do we, how do we regain the advantage? Okay. Have, 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 did you, have you or anybody else studied the ancient Chinese strategist Sun Tzu? He had a saying that says, do not attack your enemy's strengths, attack their weakness. If someone gets very strong with AI, with, let me, I know a little bit about AI. Let's say we got the facial recognition, the voice recognition, the sensory recognition of an individual. Well, how do you mask that? Are we worried that the enemy is going to target you as a SEAL and make you a high value target in a, in a preemptive strike? Yeah. What I'm saying is, your question is po poised in today's solution space and a problem. I would make it, I'd have you consider changing your, your problem statement to be, how do we have a superiority with other smart international potential adversaries how do we stay ahead of them or neutralize that a technology I'll, I'll let you play with a little bit but you really need to oh, excuse me you don't really need to it helps if your your problem is a large big problem and it will take you weeks or a month to get the problem statement right. And make it a five or 10 or 20 year out, because those are the big problems. The small problems are being incrementally worked on. Don? Yeah, that's right, Jim. Thinking about what the right problem is takes time and is not always clear. And uh, I think that was part of the lesson learned with Hamming and indeed us re-asking these hard kinds of questions every Friday. What should I be working on? Why aren't they the same? Or what is more important? Or am I just digging a hole? So here's one. Here's a hard problem. And I say it's hard because we don't know the answer yet. How do we... How do we disseminate all of Hamming's knowledge? How do we share it? We've had it all this time. His books are there. It's kind of in the fabric of many, many things. Yet he spoke to some, if not eternal truths, then at least it's eternal challenges and eternal uh, methods for progress that we can all benefit from. So in the context, going meta here, in the context of this course, I've always seen that as, wow, how, how do we do that? Because people keep giving us tools. You know, we have some fancy things this time around, and, or at least fancier than last time. They might look pretty crude later. But it's experimental. It's judged by other people. So I'm saying that not to go, my, what a wonderful question, but rather, that kind of what is the hard question that's been a motivator right from the beginning on this course is how do we use technology to share Hamming's ideas? How do we engage people? How do we make it useful? How do we get it to work over longer periods of time? So it's a very useful process. It's helped this course itself. Indeed, we wouldn't exist without that kind of hard thinking and Thank you for queuing it up today in, in ways that can really help us recognize the importance of this, this kind of inquiry. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else? Lauren, Bert, Michelle? Yeah, I'm set. From the general idea that time is the only resource that we can never get back, we do a really lousy job of dealing with time, dealing with time synchronization, 
And that is basically a pervasive problem through almost everything. In the general, you know, look at the military area, you've got command and control systems, you've got computer simulations, you've got trainers, you've got people playing games. All of those are simulations. All of those deal with time. And all of those have currently a 1950s version of how do they synchronize. We're really, really bad with it. We're hit by the tyranny of the speed of light and people throw hands up and say, we're all done. Well, maybe that, well, not maybe. I'm saying that isn't the case. That's what I'm working on is a simulation system that manages time in a way so that you can distribute computations amongst many machines that don't have to be right next to each other and you don't lose track of time. So now you can start having simulations that are very large, that are like one simulation instead of what we have right now, which is simulations that are very large that we call one simulation, that are really a whole bunch of independent simulations that are kind of operating somewhat on the same day rule and, and just going from there. And I think a huge number of the problems that we're dealing with will be somewhat addressable if you can start dealing with this idea of simulation and communication and networking these things together. I mean, now you can start talking, you're going from somebody talking about AR one person at a time to AR in a shared way. Now there's an entirely different way to start thinking about command and control systems, communication, classrooms start talking about training AI. Now you're not talking about one cluster at a time. Now you're talking about huge numbers of machines that can start thinking in time in a sane way instead of in an insane way, which is the only way we think about time and AI now. There's just so much of it that's all stuck together by bowing down to what we think is a limitation that really isn't anymore a lot of words it's it's not the 20 or 30 words that you're talking about but that's that's what's behind where all this stuff goes and what you said earlier about science fiction that's where a lot of what i'm working on comes from not the specific things i'm doing but somebody pops something out there and it's oh well how would you do that and then you work it out from there and it's amazing what you can come up with and don your your solution is uh joan and voltaire from the foundation trilogy we uh we need to add a uh, a richard to Joan and Voltaire. You have, have you read that and remembered those at all, Marty? I I uh, I think the dog ate my homework on that one. Okay. Yeah, as so, uh, old as Asimov. Actually, Joan and Voltaire. I think we're in some of the spinoffs after. Uh, yeah, the, Vol the, the Voltaire. The Voltaire I got, but uh, yeah, I I've, I've got it in my library, but it's getting to read those things again and bring it back to my memory. This It's not easy to pull together a hard problem and it's very hard to do it alone. Hamming's way was Friday afternoon, great thoughts. I strongly encourage you to find like thinking, but from different domain people and talk every week to get in new ideas. I mean, reading science fiction is wonderful. Reading Journal of American you know, Medical. I, I try to read a lot of different things. I don't call myself yet a polymath, but I try to read a lot. And then all of a sudden I get some ideas and then I pass it on and somebody else like you all will execute it. Don, you flash yellow. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marty. So, uh, wow, isn't this fun? Lauren, hats off to you for really grabbing this nettle hard in your doctoral research and tackling a problem that is severe, is serious, is so endemic a limitation that the majority of practitioners don't see it. You said it a better way, but they, they don't see it as a limitation. They see it as, oh, well, this is the playing field. And you, by re-asking and re-asking the question of what are the right problems, you now are reaching it. 
and trying to grab that. And please uh, work some of that into one of your answers and link maybe your your paper in your chapter somewhere in the course material so people can follow your trail right now. But let's cut, let me say one more thing and then bounce it back to you. Interesting contrast with an Asimov. Isaac Asimov's great. I, I got as in high school, I got to see him in a bookstore yelling at people, oh, we got to do the future, you know. And uh, he, he wrote over 100 books, tremendous thinker. And books like that continue to have influence today. But isn't an interesting contrast of theory to practice, of imagination to who are we, what are we doing? Hanning doesn't say, what could the world be like? He doesn't say, what should the world be like? He, he, the question he poses to you, and I, I, it's got to be a very carefully chosen question because he spent the better part of his life addressing that. How do you make yourself better? How do you rise above, as, as Marty told us today, rise above, I, I have nothing. How do I, how do I get somewhere? So how do you recognize what are the key limitations of your field? What are the key questions of your field? What are we forgetting? What are we needing to do? I think that's, that's a powerful habit, it's a powerful point of view. It's not fictional. It's targeted towards what could we do? And, and again, hats off, Lauren. You've done a lot there. Yeah, I'd like to. Thanks. I'd like to add uh, a second part. Most of us are problem solvers. We start from our solutions and try to extrapolate our solutions to new problem domains. What Hamming was, I believe, also challenging us to say, what are the problems 10 or 15 years now? rather than extrapolate our solutions. A little more on that in a second. This is not easy, but you need a number of people and say, you know, let, let me use Hamming's example. He's at Bell Labs in 1956. The transistor had been invented. We didn't have to use relay computers anymore. But what's the problem? Are we going, you know, AT&T was a regulated monopoly. People used voice. Digital was known. Were we going to, could, could he foresee the internet? Could he foresee petabits of information? Or I keep on forgetting the, what's beyond peta? What's, what's, what's a thousand peta, somebody? Exo. Exo, exobits. Handling that with, do we do, we do uh, multicolor over the fiber optics? You realize the fiber optics we've dropped are operating at approaching exhibits using primarily white light, but there's 255 colors if you want to. So there's tremendous bandwidth waiting for future applications. What are the applications that would use exobit per second communications. Are we going to have the holodeck on Star Trek? Are we going to 3D print a temporary version of the person we're talking to? Don't know, but that's extrapolating our solutions. Having said that's the jobs of engineers, and many of you and myself, my degree is also in engineering. Having was trying to say, what is the problem not what's the solution to the problem. It's a different way of thinking, and you really need to step back with a group of people with a beer or not a beer. Hamming didn't drink, so I can't say he ever did the beer routine. But I found it useful to try this, and I have a half a dozen people I, I bounce ideas off of. Don's one of them. And who knows what comes out of it. I want to leave you with a quote. How many of you have? Could I offer? Uh, of course. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Marty. 
Let me offer a hamming story, first person hamming story that you're uh, along that thought direction. Okay, so I've seen Hanning talk a few times, knew him, took his probability and statistics for a computer science students course and great respect, you know, what a guy. And so here, here I am I'm uh, working on my PhD program. And one of the things, the requirements always change, but at the time, one of the requirements was, well, pick some of these courses you don't like. <laughs> Which is good. It stretches you. So I'll take this course, and it's all about theory of computation. What is computable? And Marty, if you extrapolate, well, it's getting faster and faster. What happens when we have infinite bandwidth? What happens... As Hanning says, we get the physics department to finally fix the uh, time travel problem. Okay, well, maybe they're working on that actually over in the quantum category, but I had a real problem in this course with how they presented a handful of proofs that said, well, we're trying to uh, prove by induction and prove by counterexample and prove by the absence of contradiction that something is true. And it had to do with uh, PNP complete, if, if you happen to be familiar with that kind of thing, theory of comp computability. And they had all these great elaborate things. And this is the mid nineties. There's, and more theoretical work, but they pushed really hard, really hard on, okay, look, no matter what we do, we cannot disprove it, so therefore it must be true. <laughs> no, really. So, Study the book, you know, and, and, uh, Dr. Hanning, can I talk to you? Well, yeah, sure. Come on in. Come on. So I go in. Uh, I didn't bring chocolate. I was too upset. And, and it described this problem. I, I don't get it. Why are they forcing us to take something and they're basing? It, this wasn't just like a cul-de-sac topic. This was they're basing this whole line of inquiry on what they're calling a proof. And they call themselves theoreticians and mathematically and grounded. And, and their proof is we can't disprove it. And how, how, how can you base so much stuff on it with so much confidence when, when your fundamental building block isn't correct? I give you the long term because that's a, a minor, you know, a de-amplification of, I was kind of motivated at the time because I was like, I can't talk to these people. Who can I talk to? What can I have? My advisor said, oh, go talk to Hammond. Okay, yeah, okay. So I talk to Dr. Hammond. So he hears me out. You know, he's giving me the look. And he knows all about this, I can tell. He knows all about this issue. Long silence. I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at him, and he goes, well done. Know your enemy. <laughs> and that's all he would say about it. <laughs> I said, okay, all right. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Hammock. Okay, fine. And, and boy, I pondered that for quite a while, but the most prominent way to interpret that, I thought, is when a whole branch of your field appears to do something that you really think is wrong or disagree with it. His advice was to understand it fully, understand it fully, which I think in a long way around is maybe this exact same thing of what are the key problems in your field? No, really, what really are the key problems in your field that you should work on? Okay, Don, I'll, I'll agree with, you know, good example. I didn't uh, have that particular experience with Hamming. 
Hamming would say the following. He was, he started out as a theoretical mathematician and then got applied very quickly. But Hamming would say, if something works, consider using it. If you can't prove that it's true, can you demonstrate that it's, you know, not false? Can you do the, and if all of that fails and it still gives you useful results, the answer is in the results, not the math. Hamming is quoted as saying, you should know enough math, but not so much as to prevent you from getting to your goal. Mathematics is a tool invented by man. Hamming ran an experiment. Did Hamming ever give you the discussion on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics? Why does mathematics work? I can give it to you in 60 seconds. We use base 10 because we have eight fingers and two thumbs, right? Computers, we use binary because those of us engineers know the on-off state is very effective. We had calculators that were base 10. The Hamming took all of the universal constants he could find, Avogadro's number, hundreds and hundreds of constants. And he said, we're just one species in this insignificant galaxy, according to Carl Sagan. And we do all of our math in base 10 because we have eight fingers and two thumbs. The ancient Peloponnesians for a while used base 20 because they had open-toed sandals. I think that was a little joke there. But the point being is we use base 10. And if you took enough universal constants, would you expect that if you counted up the number of zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nines, that there'd be an equal distribution? You know, this is a mathematical exercise. Well, he ran it on a computer. So he, he programmed 500 or 1,000 constants, looked at the digits, and it turns out it was nowhere near a flat distribution. But you can use base 9 or base 8 or base 7. And he recalculated the constants in different bases. So like base 8, for those who don't work in math, is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. There's no eight. Our base ten stops zero to nine. If you recalculate in different bases, all of a sudden at base six, that distribution of zero through five came out nearly flat for the 500 constants. Hamming wrote this up. I don't know if it was in a major paper, but let me just put my hands up here. You know, base six, does anyone remember ET? How many fingers did he have? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Hamming said, I don't know what it means that at base six, the constants, yeah, you're glowing your finger. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> at base six, things work. Toby, please say something so we get you on the screen with your finger. Let, let me call home. <laughs> <laughs> E.T. call home. So having would, mine would go that way, and I encourage you to have your, you know, think four impossible things a day. If you want to be a scientist, if you want to be part of the future solutions, you've got to do great thoughts. I mentioned Carl Sagan before. I'd like to give you one of my favorite quotes from Carl Sagan. And this is as an encouragement for you to write and read outside of your field. This is on the opening page of Cosmos, Carl Sagan's first and most powerful book, I think. And he's talking about a book. A book is made from a tree. It is an assemblage of flat, flexible parts, still called leaves, imprinted with dark, pigmented squiggles. One glance at it, and you hear the voice of another person, perhaps someone dead for a thousand years. 
across the millennial, the author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people, citizens of distant epochs who never knew one another. Books break the shackles of time, proof that humans can work magic. I give you the book. Read other great books. Write great articles and books. Buy my book. <laughs> I commend to you to write. It will open up your thinking, whether it is a 200 word article. Hamming would, up until about eight years before he passed in January of 98, Hamming used a, I think it was a Royal or an Underwood upright typewriter. Only in this last eight years of his life, in the 90s, did he use a terminal. He was comfortable with a typewriter. I have letters written to me by him on a typewriter. But he wrote, and so each day he would write a one or two or three page notes on things. When put together, he had a book. Along the way, he used it for a lecture. As an author, I have five books. This one is my first biography. It's hard, it's taken me three years. A year to research, a year to write, a year to edit. Because if I look back at my 200th version ago, it wasn't good. It's better. Write your ideas down. I do it early in the morning. The first half an hour, hour a day, I write. I don't know when Hamming did his writing, but I know he was prolific. There's thousands of pages of Hamming two and three page things some of which may never have appeared in a follow-on publication, some did. You, I, I suggest you open up a word processor, put today's date, random thoughts about how do I solve, solve the time variance problem. Back to Mike, I think you were talking about the problem of time. Most engineering and math solutions assuming, assume that time is invariant. It's not. It's just most of us don't know how to handle that dimension. Some people do. I commend to you good authors. Carl Sagan's got a new book out on Ancestry. Ancestry is my wife's reading it. She says it's exceptional. I commend to you when you leave NPS as you move forward in your career. I had a very early boss and I started writing. I got out my undergraduate college at 69. My master's was in 72. In 71, I started writing for journals and, and things, and I have about 60 publications. My old writing wasn't good, but it was the start. You have to pass your thoughts on to others, and then people can see what you are saying and improve it. End of lecture. Are there any questions about Hamming that someone wants to throw at me? He's been in my head and in my life for six years. I might be able to fill in an open question. Did Hamming like Monty Python at all? Or, you know, any of the, was I think, he inculcated as a true geek? He wasn't an engineer, although he did have model railroads. And if you want to see it, go to Hirsch Loomis's office in Spanagle the fourth level, having had a train set, he liked, if those of you remember, I'm trying to think of the proper word, the, the, the five-line uh, cadence uh, limericks. But remember, Hamming was born 1915. So if you say the formative years are 20 to 40, that's 1935 to 55. A lot of his habits and likes would have been in that time genre. I think Monty Python is more our generation. And yes, I like Monty Python. Thanks. You're welcome, Lauren. Come on, throw me a question, coach. Yeah, I could lie and you wouldn't know whether, I, whether I'm lying or not. Marty, I could say that 
we will use you as a resource in this course as we continue going forward because it's easy to see that our question list has grown another size or two since the beginning of this course. So thank you for all of your efforts, not just in the biography, but in the course and this entire activity of communicating the Hamming legacy. You're welcome. I had to do it. There was, I woke up three years ago and said, I wish I had time to, to sit down with Richard and Wanda Hamming and ask them questions before they passed. You may not, Richard Hamming died of a heart attack. There were no obvious symptoms beforehand. He taught a course that ended in December. He was an emeritus professor. He didn't have to teach. He had, I have pictures of him at a Christmas party that year. By the photograph, you don't see an ailing person. On the 6th or 7th of January, he went to bed as normal and didn't wake up. Not a bad way to go, folks. He's left behind a lot for us, but he wants you to not mimic him. He wants you to pick and choose the tools that Hamming and I commend to you, Richard Feynman, if you can see his lectures, a brilliant teacher, contemporary. He passed a number of years ago. Some older mathematicians, some older physicists, look outside your field and if you want to be effective in what you do, get some role models even now. Okay, so that, well, well, Marty, again, thank you. And uh, let me bring that really close to home for many of you here. Entry point in this course, how does studying Hamming help your thesis? All right, crunch time, you're finishing. Work it in there, and I'll even give you an extra inning. When you hand it in to the thesis processor and they crunch and chunk and look at your formatting and your semicolons and whatnot, you can still write and you can add another page on your motivation if that helps your work. And even when that, that deadline passes, you can still be thinking and adding it. So, so welcome to the frontier. Welcome to the journey. Please uh, apply Hamming's great guidance and put in your thesis. Postscript on? Okay, postscript. When you do a PhD, it's expected you'll publish either before you complete your degree or thereafter. I had three publications and one keynote presentation at a conference. At the master's level, publish. Get into the habit of writing. And again, make your first paper 500 words and you'll ultimately get it longer. Some of Hamming's brilliant writings are a page and a half long. Don't feel like you have to do another thesis or another dissertation. Capture your thoughts, submit it for publication. Right. So great advice, great advice for all of us. Thank you all for participating today. Have a safe, vigilant, productive week. See you next week. Thanks. Have a great week. So long, everyone. Thanks, Marty. You're welcome.